Well, I haven't even combed my hair. This is atrocious. <gasps> this is just atrocious. I have my nightlight on my screen. Oh my gosh. Would you look at that? When I look in the mirror, it just, it doesn't look that bad. I have to microwave my tea. And I have to go brush my hair. That is unacceptable. Hey. Okay? Excuse me for my un, I look very unbecoming. Okay. Ooh, three cubes of sugar is the magic number. I'll be right back, okay? I didn't realize I was so, um, ooh. Man. I was having a great day. I went to you and I was coming back. I brought my makeup with me. <laughs> I brought my makeup bag with me. Ew. What, ew. Mm -hmm. what the H is going on with my roots, right? What's, what? Everything's reverse. Everything's in, re oh, everything's in reverse. I have to remember that. When I think I'm touching this side or I'm looking in there, I'm like, okay, I want to touch this side. It's, it's opposite. Confusing. So please excuse me. I definitely need. Oh, it's because I was going to do my own roots. That's why my hair is dirty. I was like, okay, don't wash your hair today. It's not dirty enough to to bleach your hair. That's why my hair looks disgusting. And then I looked again, and I was like, it's not. My roots aren't long enough to do. They need to get a little bit longer. Look. I was in the bathroom brushing my hair and I was looking at my lipstick. I was like, how do I make myself look more presentable? Maybe some lipstick. Some little blushy blush. Whoops, too high. The screen really doesn't work like a mirror for me. Nope, I'm completely off. Completely off. You would think it would be more like a mirror, but maybe it's because everything is reversed. It's like when, like when you take selfies and then you look at them, you're like, my face looks all uh, misshapen. It's because it's the opposite of looking in the mirror. When you see pictures taken of you, where the camera's pointed at you, you know, the real camera. And then you look at it, you're actually seeing the opposite of what you really look like. You would think it would look the same in reverse, but it doesn't. And it's because there's something here. It's because um, it, there's differences. It's not the same on both sides. Oh, man. My arm is really sore. I was picking up my microphone. Oh my God, it is so heavy. It's gaining weight. So I thought it, I thought it, oh no, I can't do this without a mirror. I'll have to go get a mirror. I completely forgot about my tea. 
sunny outside. It has been really windy and rainy and cold. And it's almost May. I refuse to wear winter clothes. But I'm, I, I've lost my tolerance to uh, the cold. I used to be fine with the cold wind whipping my face. But now I can't take it. I've become a, a wimp. Just very upsetting. I still love the cold, but I can't. I can't take the the wind. Oh, trying with my face. Absolutely nothing. Last time I put on. Oh, see, I messed up already. Last time I put on lip liner, I went outside the lines and I looked like a clown. An actual clown. Not just like a to uh, like a goofball, but a, like a real clown. Nobody's here, so that's good. <laughs> Most people get upset when nobody watches their lives, I would think. But I prefer no having no one here. Oh, my arms are so heavy and stuff. Oh, okay. It's the top that I have a problem with. Top lip. I don't want to go outside of the line. And also, this, this liner is really hard to take off. I mean, it wears down eventually, but if you make one little slip and you try to wipe it, it just gets worse. That looks terrible. I, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a big makeup person. I used to wear foundation quite a few years ago, and since I was a teenager, I guess. I mean, I didn't wear makeup to school all the time, but I would always have foundation in my arsenal. I remember the last time I bought foundation when I was going through all my makeup because I had this was like my main bag. Then I had a bigger bag which had just tons of stuff in it and I had like four or five bottles of different foundations because oh my god okay that that was a piece of a uh, great leaf I'm just gonna sit here and do my makeup guys I brought this but if I put this over it it's really nice it's like it has shininess to it like it looks like satin or something. But it's going to go all over my teeth because I have like big overbite teeth. Oh, I screwed up already. They're also like little flaky things. Like one side goes up. What the hell? What the hell? Can... Who's here? Who's here? Anybody here? Hello, hello, hello. Oh, this looks terrible. I've been on 10 minutes and I haven't done anything. I'm waiting, well, I'm trying to drink tea instead of waiting to go get a coffee, but I keep looking to see if it's almost nine. Yeah, I ran out of coffee. So my um, closest supermarket 
just closed because they're switching to a different type of supermarket. They're only opening back up in August. So that's, we'll count April, April, May, June, July, August. It's like four or five months. Why should it take that long? They're not like expanding the building or anything. But they're changing to a supermarket that has better prices, even though, I mean, like all the food's the same practically, I'm sure. Um, but where am I going to get my grapes and ex espresso from? Well, I've been doing the uh, Instacart, ordering from Instacart, but sometimes you, you don't feel like going through all that rigmarole, right? Rigmarole, rigmarole. I think I still also have to get used to this screen. It's so big. Yeah. <laughs> all right. We'll put a bit of this. Oh, I already did this, but I don't see it. So I'll put on more. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yesterday I sat down to record chapter seven and I'm using all the same software and microphone as you can see and all the settings were the same, but, um, the sound was weird and the little things that shows, you know, like you get louder that the things go whoop, the little lines. You know what I'm talking about. They were like all smaller than they should be. And I imported ch the chapter six audio. So that came right underneath. And you could see like the, the lines were like bigger. And it's just, I don't know what's going on. I tried Googling and asking questions and... Um, I got a few results of people having the exact same problem, and there were a lot of answers and replies telling them what might be the problem, turn off audio enhancements, which I did, um, and I've been fiddling with the gain on the microphone and the recording levels in Audacity, but it just doesn't want to work, so, but we'll get it figured out. You better believe it. We'll get it figured out, and I, did I tell you? I've ordered um, the Applewood edition of Sign of the Twisted Candles. I'm so excited to get it because the revised one, I think it's a really fun story and it's one of my favorite, one of my favorite books, most enjoyable. So the plot of the original is a bit different and I really, really enjoy the old, the older books before they, I mean, the really older ones, where she carries a gun and such. I think this is number eight, so it's going to be like that, I believe. Maybe I can look it up and find out kind of what the plot is. You know when you go on Wikipedia to look up the premise of something, like a movie or a book, and they end up telling you the whole plot? Well, I've learned that they do that sometimes, so you have to be very careful. Sometimes they tell you... Like, what happens at the end? And ruin it. I don't think that should be allowed. Okay, I'm going to go get my book and put this back. I'm going to microwave my tea right now. I'm drinking Red Rose Orange Pico tea. But I didn't have it stored well, so it's kind of lost its flavor. Um, three white sugar cubes. And 2% milk Canadian, from Canadian cows. You better believe it. I only drink milk from Canadian cows.
It's right on time. time. I got there at two seconds. I know that all microwaves beep differently. There's one microwave I yell at all the time. It's my parents' microwave. I'll tell you about it. Let me tell you about my parents' microwave. Okay. When it finishes, it beeps like five times in succession. If you don't open the door right away, if you're in the other room, I don't know, like a, down the hall or something, you're going to hear it beep when it finishes. But if you don't open it in time, if you don't get back there and open the door in time, it will beep five times again. And I say, I heard you. I'll open you when I'm ready. Look what I got. Mystery of the glowing eye. Ooh. Perino's looking at me. Actually, he's more looking at the, the ceiling. So this is a very big computer and it takes up a lot of space. Just lovely, just lovely. Let's see how far up we can go. Well, as you may, ooh, as you may remember, we were, um, we had started reading The Mystery of the Glowing Eyeballs. And somebody put Winnie the Pooh foil stickers in it. That's, that's nice. Who's your favorite Winnie the Pooh character? Mine's Rabbit. Poor Rabbit. Right. Wait a minute. Yeah, we read three chapters when we started this book. And I am thrilled with it. It is really fun. We read chapter one, Runaway Helicopter. Chapter two, A Suspected Forgery. And chapter three, A Glowing Eye. Chapter four is called Fiery Red Hair. So what have we got going on here? Mr. Drew, Carson Drew, has an assistant or something. Is she an assistant or a new secretary? She's like a lawyer in training or something, I think. And he's like spending all his time with this chick. And they're they're doing a new a new case or something. And Nancy is so jealous. When Nancy Drew eagerly agrees to help her lawyer father solve the mystery of the glowing eye, she has no way of knowing that it will involve the kidnapping of her close friend, Ned Nickerson. Oh, yeah. Ooh, it's been a while and now, come on, remember what happened. Do you ever get really frustrated when you're reading a book and you put it away for like a few weeks and then you can't remember what happened? You're like, well, what's the point? What's the point if I don't remember? Puzzling note in Ned's handwriting sets Nancy and her friends Bess and George on a hazardous search for a bizarre criminal. From their base of operations, the Emerson College campus, the three girl detectives and Ned's college pals follow a maze of clues to locate the kidnapper's hideout and rescue Ned. Not only is Nancy greatly worried about Ned, but also, she is alarmed by the high-handed methods of a woman lawyer who tries to take the case away. Every reader will thrill to Nancy's exciting adventures as she unravels this dangerous web of mystery. So there's always an illustration in the first chapter, Runaway Helicopter, right? That is the Drew house. And that, oh, right. The helicopter was like a robot copter. Right. There was nobody in the helicopter because it was like remote controlled. Oh, yeah. And there was a note in it and it said, 
It was a warning. It said, beware of Cyclops, Ned. Not Cyclops, Ned, but beware of Cyclops, period, Ned. And then there was some Chief McGinnis, and they went to a restaurant. I like that part where they they went to a restaurant. Oh, right. And they met that lady who reminded me of the Cinderella stepmother or something. And Bess was kind of funny. I'm trying to remember what's going on here. Mixing up two books, I think. I'm trying not to mix up the invisible intruder with the glowing eye. I mean, there's like some boats and stuff in this book. Didn't they go to a museum with a lady? Yeah. Oh, right. Um, Bess and George could have shouted with excitement. But they kept still and followed the straight-backed woman with the up-tilted head. She led the girls through a section filled with figures of knights in armor and deadly swords. Ugh, I don't like this room, Bess whispered. It's too scary. That is too bad, said Miss Wilkin. And the, presently they came to the most unusual exhibit the girls had ever seen. Enlarged glass eyes hung on all the walls. In display cases beneath them were pictures of fish, animals, and humans with descriptions of their types of eyes. Look, said George, this caption says a housefly has a compound eye with 4,000 lenses. No wonder he's hard to catch, Nancy remarked. Just then, all the lights went out. The room was in complete darkness. But in a moment, a reddish light began to appear high on the rear wall. Seconds later, it became a fiery, glowing eye. End of chapter three. So are we kind of remembering what's going on here? Did we find Ned? She's called up, um, what's his face? Ned's father and, and asked if they know anything about Cyclops. And Nancy's mother is pleading, use your best detective instincts to find him. Why did I think her and Ned like went to a bridge or something and he was knocked out? Is that this one? I'm remembering a scene, but I don't even know if it's in this book. It's in a book. It could only be this one, our Invisible Intruder. And I, it's not Invisible Intruder. I'm so confused. Has Ned been found in this book? What book was I reading where she and Ned went to like a bridge? And then she went to a cabin and there was a dummy who she thought was Ned. Was that the invisible intruder? Please help me. I'm so confused. We haven't met Ned yet, have we? He's still missing, isn't he? Okay, I have to check the Invisible Intruder because I'm so confused right now. I don't know what other book it could be. I'm not reading another Nancy Drew book. Put it out of your head. 
You'll figure it out. I will figure it out. Okay, let's do this. Chapter four, fiery red hair. For several seconds, Nancy, Bess, and George stood transfixed by the awesome sight of the glowing eye. At times, it blinked and seemed to grow redder. Bess grabbed Nancy's hand. What is it? She whispered tensely. I don't know. Let's get out of here, Bess pleaded. This place gives me the creeps. Not yet, Nancy answered. I want to see what happens. The words were barely said when the glowing eye disappeared. There was pitch blackness for several seconds. Then the ceiling lights came on. Nancy turned to ask Miss Wilkin for an explanation. She had vanished. Where did she go and why? George asked. She's a strange person. Bess and George started for the entrance, but Nancy paused to look closely at the spot where the glowing eye had appeared. Though the wall was of wood and paneled in large squares, there was no visible opening or sliding section near the glowing eye. Nancy found a high stool and set it under the panel where the glowing eye had shown. She stood on the stool but was unable to move the panel, and the wood was not hot. Nancy was sure no image of the eye had been projected onto the wall. There must be a cold light behind this panel, she said to herself, a very bright, heatless light. Her friends had come back. Learn anything? George asked. No, Nancy replied. It's a puzzle. The girls found Miss Wilkin at her desk in the entrance hall. She still had the same expressionless look and offered no explanation of what had happened. Nancy asked her for one. The woman answered stiffly. I left to see why the lights went out. And the glowing eye, Nancy prodded. That, Miss Wilkin replied, is used by the engineering students at Emerson who come here to attend lectures given by our member scientists. And the students, and are the students supposed to give an explanation of the glowing eye? Nancy asked. Yes, but so far, none of them has. The woman stood up and escorted the visitors to the front door. She seemed eager to have them leave. Nancy smiled and said, May we come again sometime and see more of the exhibits? If you wish, Miss Wilkin replied, but there was no cordiality in her voice. The girls drove off, discussing the strange adventure. Do you suppose, George asked, that Ned is connected with the glowing eye bit? Perhaps, Nancy replied. He's in the engineering school, but I'm surprised that he didn't mention it when I told him about the glowing eye. I'm not, George smiled. Maybe he thought he could find a solution on his own, she teased. So she spoke to him. When did she speak to him? She made a photostat of Ned's note. What a gruesome story. Oh, right, right. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he thought he could find a solution on his own, she teased. Oh, I'm not, George smiled. Maybe he thought he could find a solution on his own, she teased. Nancy said, Ned may have figured out the secret of the glowing eye and been kidnapped because of his discovery. That could connect the kidnappers with the Anderson Museum, George commented. Maybe in a roundabout way, Nancy replied. To herself, she was saying, I wonder how much Marty King knows about this. Bess, silent until now, said, I didn't like that, Miss Wilkin, and I wouldn't trust her the length of this car. She's spooky, and I'll bet she knows a lot more than she's telling. I'm inclined to agree, said Nancy. Let's stop at the library and see what we can find out about the Anderson Museum.
as I was reading, I was still pondering what was the book? What was the book that I, uh, where I was reading about the trolls and stuff? Maybe it was the invisible intruder. There's some kind of weird thing on my, get out of me. What is all the, hey, what's this? What is all this? I have to microwave again. Mm -hmm. No, not three minutes. Three, oh. Whew. Ah. I'm going to get the invisible intruder. I can't take it now. I just, I can't see it being in this book. Ugh. I just can't see it being in this book. And I know I read it. It was Nancy and Ned. What's the matter with this canoe? Mm. Such confusion. Although I read, see, this is where we are. This is how much we've read on YouTube. And this is where I am reading it to myself. So it could have been through here. It must be all this part that I'm thinking where this bridge stuff happened. Yeah, it's got to be. It's got to be. That's it. That's the answer. That's the answer. Okay, the girls are off to the library to learn more about the Anderson Museum. Hat. Remind me to take a sip. Okay. I was like, I have no room for myself here. The girl at the reference desk told... The girl at the reference desk there told them she had never been to a museum, but under to the museum, but understood it was a spooky place. But look in the newspaper file. I think there's an article in one of the papers. Which one? Nancy's search was not particularly rewarding. She learned that a large fund had been left to the museum as an endowment to take care of it for educational purposes. There was no mention of a glowing eye. Perhaps Bert and Dave will know something about it. George suggested. Nancy drove directly to the Omega Chi Salon fraternity house. Bert and Dave had just come in and greeted the girls warmly. Bert was a rather stocky, athletic, blonde boy. Dave was slender and blonde. Why did I think one was a brunette? I don't know. Dave, Dave was slender and blonde. They played on the college football team with Ned. Any news of Ned? Nancy asked immediately. Not a word, Bert replied. But Dave and I tracked down a bit of information that might link a certain man with Ned's disappearance. Tell me about him, Nancy begged. Bert said that in one of the Ned one of Ned's engineering courses, there was a graduate graduate student with fiery red hair who worked next to Ned in the lab. He disappeared at the same time Ned did. We also learned, Dave added, that this Zap Crossin has a pilot's license. The red-haired kid is Zap Crosson. Z-A-P-P. -P, cross S-O-N. Zap Brannigan. What? Okay. That name just popped into my head. Is, is that a person from another book? Zap Brannigan? Zap? Zap? I don't know. Or Zip Zap Brannigan? I don't know. 
Nancy was intrigued by this information. So he could have flown the mysterious copter and known how to program the craft to fly itself. The boys nodded and Bert said, Nancy, we thought you'd probably what Nancy, we thought you'd probably know what to do next. Any clues about where the copter went? she asked. Dave said no one in the vicinity of Emerson knew anything about a helicopter which had the same registration number as the pilotless craft. The local police had made inquiries at a small airfield on the outskirts of Emerson and also talked with members of a balloon club nearby. No one had a lead. I wonder if the girls are going to go up in a hot air balloon. I think that's what they mean, right? That's what I gather. It's a hot air balloon club and not a bunch of guys who like take those long balloons and make animals out of them. It could also be that. Which do you think it is? Balloon animals or hot air balloons? It's still early enough to do some exploring before dinner, Dave said. While you girls are in Emerson, you can stay here in our first floor guest room. Is that allowed? Mm -hmm. Bess giggled. I didn't know you had one. Dave grinned. Oh, old Omega Chi Epsilon aims to keep up to date, he said. The girls were led to a charming room with three beds in it and an adjoining bath. I'll take your car, Nancy, and fill it with gas, Bert offered. Meet you all in front in ten minutes. While the girls were washing their hands and combing their hair, George asked Nancy, What are your thoughts about Zap Crossan? Nancy replied, I've been wondering if there was any connection between Zap's project and, a, and an experiment on which Ned might have been working. Ned may have been keeping his own a secret until he had completed the experiment. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Zap is from the Futurama TV show. Right. He's Phil Hartman, I think, right? He's like kind of big and wears a weird maroon-shaped thing. Right. I like the lobster. What is his name? Zoidberg. He was my favorite. Okay. Just then, the boys returned. They knew where the nearby airfields were located, so the five young people climbed into the car. Bess and George told them the story of the glowing eye. Nancy felt lonesome without Ned and started worrying even more about him than she had before. Sensing this, Dave said lightly, Speaking of glowing eyes, I learned in bio class today that a crayfish's eye has 4,000 parts. Each one is a separate eye. George grinned. I didn't know the bottom of the sea had enough to see to require that many eyes. Oh, George, said her cousin Bess. That's a horrible pun. The others laughed. Bert, who was at the wheel, asked, Where to? Nancy smiled. Directly northeast from my home in River Heights. Emerson is slightly northeast, Bert replied. So suppose we go due east. Everyone agreed. Within 10 minutes, they came to a private flying field. A helicopter was just coming in. Bert turned into the driveway and went directly toward the Whirlybird's landing spot. A pleasant young, a pleasant looking young pilot leaped down. Hi, he said. Want a ride? Nancy jumped from the car. Do you take people sightseeing, she asked, as an idea flashed into her mind. Sure thing. Any place within a radius of 150 miles. My rates are low. Nancy thought so, too, when she heard what they were. How many passengers can you take? Three. We'll go, said Nancy. Are you ready? In a few minutes. I'll fill her up with fuel and take you up for an hour. Ooh. I really hope there's some hot balloon action, hot air balloon action. Maybe the chapters will tell me. 
chapter list. Wilderness cabin. Weird heel mark. I don't see anything about balloons. <clears throat> While the pilot was doing this, Nancy quickly explained to her friends that she thought it was a marvelous opportunity to view the countryside near Emerson. Which two if you want to go? Bess and Dave offered to stay on the ground. I'd like to take a look around and see the planes here, Dave said. Quarter of an hour later, the three passengers climbed aboard and the helicopter rose. I'm Glenn Munson, the pilot said. Anything in particular you'd like to see? Nancy introduced herself and her friends. Yes, as many airfields, public and private, that you have time to show us. Glenn raised his eyebrows. For any special reason? Nancy told of the mysterious helicopter landing on the Drew's lawn. Have you ever seen or heard of a robot copter around this area? She asked. Sure. A friend of mine who's a computer expert has one. Want to meet him? Nancy was so excited she could hardly keep her voice calm. But she managed to say, we'd love to. Munson steered his craft in a half circle, flew a few miles, then descended. There's Jerry now, he said, just tuning up his robot copter to take off. Jerry's helicopter was much smaller than the one which had landed on the Drew's front lawn, and Nancy assumed this was the reason the police had not mentioned it. She and the others jumped down from their craft and were introduced to Jerry Faber, a tall, lanky young man with twinkling eyes. Nancy's looking for a certain robot copter, Glenn said. One that's larger than yours, she told Faber. One that's larger than yours, she told Faber. Jerry grinned. Sorry I can't help you, but come, I'll show you my real beauty of a copter. He led the group to a barn at one edge of the field and opened the door. Before them stood a big, shiny new helicopter. There's Emmy, Jerry said proudly. She's not a robot, but I can take ten passengers in her. And she has a long range, 350 miles. Nancy was disappointed that neither, heli that neither helicopter was the one she had hoped to find, but said, This big one is... I keep reversing words. This big one certainly is beautiful. Do you use it just for pleasure? No, I fly executives of nearby companies on short business trips, and sometimes other people. I had a mysterious passenger a week ago. He didn't even give me his full name. He just said, call me Crossy. Crossy? Bert bust out. What did he look like? Had bright red hair. He's the one, Bert exclaimed. We think, a warning look from Nancy kept him from saying, we think he's a kidnapper. Do you know him? I'm having trouble keeping track of how many people are in this scene. Who's Glenn again? He's the guy. He's the first pilot guy, right? Do you know him? Glenn asked in surprise. Bert replied that the man in question might be a graduate student at Emerson who had disappeared. Where did you fly him? Nancy inquired. Jerry thought a moment. Oh, I remember now. It was over River Heights. The visitors exchanged glances. Nancy asked why Jerry thought Crossy was mysterious. She was told that the man took binoculars from his pocket when they reached River Heights and trained them on every house in town. I finally laughed and asked him, You got a girlfriend down there? He said, He said, Sort of. She's a smart one. Knows the law like a lawyer. Nancy stared. Could the girl be Marty King? If so, what did she know about Crossin? Was she playing up to him to get information concerning the mystery of the glowing eye? Did Crossy tell you anything else? Nancy asked. No, he talked very little, but he did ask me a lot of questions about complicated computer programming. Bert said the graduate student from Emerson was a whiz in this subject. If you ever hear from Crossy or see him, please let us know. I sure will, Jerry replied. 
And now I must go to keep an appointment. Look around all you like. The group thanked the pilot and said goodbye. Jerry hurried back to his small helicopter and got in. He spun the rotors and took off. The others watched intently. Suddenly, George cried out, Oh my goodness, Jerry's in trouble. Everyone gazed in horror at his whirly bird, which was spiraling toward the ground. End of chapter four? Yes. End of chapter four. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. I've been trying to talk like John Travolta. When does he say that? When do, in what movie or TV show does he say, oh my God, oh my God, or something like that? Now, it's a pretty big, big and thick cup. I don't know why it doesn't hold it. Oh, I know why it doesn't hold the heat because it's very big at the top. There's a very big opening. Whereas if I put it in my Sonnenberg mug, it has a very smaller. See? That's why, right? If I put it in here, it would stay hotter longer, right? Because of the shape of the mug. I want to go back here someday. It's my most favorite place in the world. Oh, yeah, I was going to make a video about it, and I forgot. I used to have a poster that my aunt gave to me from there, from Sonnenberg, but it just, it ripped and it, I don't know, it, it just got really messed up and I wasn't able to keep it. And the only place you can like get those things like this, I bought this in the gift shop at Sonnenberg and they don't, they have like maybe a few things that you can buy online, but not stuff like this and posters and bags and t-shirts actually go to the gift shop the gift shop used to be in the big mansion but now it's somewhere else but I really liked it in the big mansion it was like way up top with a balcony and it was all bright and airy I wish I had taken pictures in there now the gift shop is not in the mansion it's just like in a different area and it's more it's more looking like a store because in the mansion it was like in a bedroom or something. Or maybe like a living room or something like that. With the big windows and it was just all beautiful, you know? Looked like you were in an old house. I loved it. Or an old mansion. Y'all have to find, I'm going to, remind me, find more pictures. Ones I've taken old pictures of Sonnenberg Gardens. And I'm just going to do a nice video about it. It's my most favorite place. I really wish I had pictures of me when I was little there, but we didn't take pictures. It's all in, it's all in my memory. I have pictures from the last time I went. There's a Buddha in the Japanese garden. And when I was little, he looked so big. And each year, he'd get smaller. Remember, Sonnenberg video. So, okay, it's getting pretty exciting. I really hope that soon there will be um, a less exciting chapter where Nancy's just at home eating and talking to Hannah and her dad. And maybe Togo could, could show up too. That would be nice before we have like a lot more excitement and action but we ended with um maybe a helicopter crash so we'll have to find out what happens there but i'm i'm really enjoying this book and i'm gonna get the audio issues figured out so that today you all, you all will get chapter seven. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I, I recorded as I was trying to make it work. How many times I recorded chapter seven, the mysterious box. And then the first sentence of the chapter. 
it's ingrained in my brain because I had I, I I I recorded it so many times. Oh, okay. So it's still not warm enough. It's really sunny out, but it's cold. But let me show you the cutest little summer outfit I bought. Okay. I got a few really cute things. I got two skirt and top sets. Oh, so cute. I, I got large. I ordered large for both of them. So this is one. And the other one, the skirt's fine, but I couldn't even put the top on me. So I had to chuck the top, but I still have the skirt. But it was size large and like I couldn't put it on. And I was very disappointed in that. But he, look at this. Look at this. Here's my skirt. And it's, I don't know what it's made of, but it's it's really soft. And like it's substantial. You can't see through it, but it's very light. The top, the skirt. And the top. It's so cute. And here's the top. And it's just the cutest thing ever. I love it. It's got um it's got a rose print on it. And it's so nice here. Here. It has this nice rose print on it. It's really soft, like brushed cotton or something. Probably not cotton. Oh, I don't know what it is because I always have to cut up all the tags because I can't stand them. And where's the skirt? 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 I can't find the skirt. Where's the skirt? Ah. And this is the skirt from the other set. I was so disappointed that um, the top, I couldn't put it on. It was like longer than the other one, but still like cropped it and off the shoulder. This, and it was so cute, but it won't fit. Like, I almost hurt myself trying to get to put it on. I thought, do I have it on upside down? But I didn't. Then I'm wearing um, a dress, this polka, yeah, this polka dot dress, a little summer dress. It's green. Oh, it's like a very dark green. Almost looks black. Um, which I love. It's so light and airy. And um, I think I'm going to order that in some different colors. But it's really, it's really light too. Um, this fabric is very, very thin. But again, you can't see through it, which is awesome. Because I don't like, I, I was just having a flashback of like, when slips were a very normal thing for women to wear. Remember my mom and my aunts and all the old people, old people, all the adult people I knew as a child, you know, adult women they wore slips under their skirts and dresses. And every now and then, you know, I come up, I, I, I get a piece of clothing that is too sheer and I'm like, well, I can't wear this. But you go into a store and you, you don't see slips anymore. Plus I hate layering, but there are some dresses that are so beautiful, but you can't wear them without a slip. Oh. Cold again. I mean, it's not cold, but it's not. I need my tea to be the exact right temperature. When's the next picture? We're going to read on the next chapter, BTW. Oh, here's a picture. Oof, I don't like it. Scary. Wait that long for the next picture? 
Um, so the next picture is in chapter nine. That's quite a while before we get to it. I feel like there should be a new the one in between here, but there's not. Yes, there is. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me. There's an illustration in the next chapter. And it's pretty funny. I mean, it's not uproarious, but it's amusing. Oh, there's a, this doesn't happen very often in a Nancy Drew book where you get, I don't know what they call that, but you get a break, right? You go to a different scene, but they actually split it here. Does anyone know what that's called? Paragraph break? I don't know. I'm trying, ooh, I'm looking ahead. Oh. Well. Oh my goodness. I'm going to switch to my, um, what do you call it? What was I wearing yesterday? It was like really bright, but very, very colorful. And I felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb because everyone's wearing gray and black and dark things. So this is, um, it really looks black there. Actually, it looks black. Okay. It changed color in my closet. What is going on? I'm going to stand by the actual real light. Oh, no, it's green over here. It's it's definitely green. Then I come over here. And it turns to black. It turns to black. Oh, I remember what I was wearing very light blue dress and then I had this pink light pink lacy little thing over it and it was very bright not bright but very colorful oh okay I ordered another well it's two different orders I've got two thrift books orders coming the Nancy Drew book, and I also ordered the collected poems of Emily Dickinson. I never maybe have read a few poems by her, and I know of her. Oh, on the Facts of Life, um, the first season, yes. In the first season of the Facts of Life, um, they had a poetry assignment, and Blair stole Emily Dickinson's poem. Yeah, the name of the episode is Emily Dickinson. So she stole a poem from Emily Dickinson and said it was her own and put it in the in the poetry. In the po she, she entered it or like she took it to school and said she wrote it. And everyone else got really bad marks on their poems, especially Tootie. First of all, Tootie is like so much younger than the other girls why are they doing the same class they're in the same classes and they're doing the same homework that makes no sense um but anyway she got very good marks Blair did on her Emily Dickinson poem and then the headmaster guy he was like I entered it in a in a contest like a statewide contest or something and Blair was like uh-oh because nobody at school realized it was an Emily Dickinson one. So that's, I know that Emily Dickinson poem. You know, this is all because of my, uh, you know why my dress looks weird? I do. Why it's like weird on one side? It's because of cancer. Thanks a lot, cancer. I've been on an hour. I've only read like for 15 minutes or less. But that's okay. Yeah, I've gotten a few comments where people are like, can you talk when you're finished the chapter? Well, I am right now, but like don't stop reading to, to look at comments or anything like that. But I can't do that. I can't do that.
I can't stop looking at how lopsided my dress is. And I adjusted the straps. They're like not at the same height, but it's still an issue. It's a really cute dress. I'm definitely going to get some more though. Um, like it's, it's got elastic here, but it's very, I get very mad at elastics. Like I've had skirts that are, they're perfect, except the elastic is like trying to kill me, you know? Um, but it just has a very easy elastic. And then it goes to about to here. It's really comfy. They have all different colors with the polka dots. So maybe I'll get a pink one. I'm all over the place, you guys. I'm sorry. Part of it is because I have a huge screen and I can see my horrible British teeth. Oh, I thought there was like a pudding skin on top of my tea, but it was just a tea bag coming to the top. Ugh. You know when you put something in the microwave too long, something that's like liquidy or um, soup maybe, and it the top gets like, I have two more tea bags, lapsang suchong. I love lapsang suchong. And you know what? I can get a coffee anytime I want because the store is open. The store where I get my yucky coffee. I got really used to this instant espresso. I had um, got at the grocery store, which is closed now. So I stopped going to the to the metro store to get my coffee every morning. And now I'm back on that, and it, it just doesn't taste as good. Mm -hmm. uh, right, Emily Dickinson. Dickinson. Emily Dickinson. I was watching a really nice documentary about her. I'm going to link it here. Um, and I fell asleep watching a few times, because I think it's from the 70s, and it's just late 70s, maybe. And it's really, really... Like a cozy one. It makes me feel cozy. Here it is. Here it is. Share, copy, paste. Here it is. And then, why do I feel like I said all this already? Anyway, I um someone I follow on Instagram. I did say this already in the other in like yesterday, I think. I remember saying it out loud. Anyway, someone I follow on Instagram, she's a knitter. She posted a picture with her current knits and a book of Emily Dickinson poems. And I was like, that's really pretty hardcover book. It looks kind of old. So I found it on Thrift Books. Um, they had different copies of it, like different ones of the same edition and I found one I, I chose the cheapest one but it's it's hardcover and it's beautiful and it just it reminds me of books from that time like the way that, that they look it has it's white cover with beautiful flowers on it and it says the collected poems of Emily Dickinson and I'm very excited to get that it's something I'll keep and cherish. Yeah. When was Emily Dickinson around? Because my great uncle Frank in his library of books, which is in my parents' house and has been there since before I was born. I don't know when they, he actually put them in the house. Um, there's no Emily Dickinson and there's like poetry galore through here in all the books. There's I don't know, I guess m m most of it is poetry. There's a lot of other books too, but there's no Emily Dickinson. So maybe um, Great Uncle Frank wasn't into Emily Dickinson. Yeah. I have to look up her birth and death dates. Emily Dickinson. Look at all these other Emilys they put before Dickinson. Oh, yeah. She was born in 1830 and died in 1886. But when was her stuff published? Because I think 
few of her poems. Oh, yeah. Her only publications during her lifetime were 10 of her nearly 1,800 poems in one letter. Oh, wow. A complete collection of her poetry. Wait, when did she die? 1886. Her first published collection of poetry was made in 1890. And then... A complete collection of her poetry first became available in 1955. Hmm. And Great Uncle Frank died in um, 1956. That's really interesting. So maybe if she had like a lot of poetry published during her lifetime, he would have been into Emily Dickinson. And there would have been some in the library, in his library. Interesting. Somebody please get up and get my tea. I'm putting on my You know which one I'm talking about. Get over here. This is going to, I mean, there's no holes in the shirt yet, but eventually it will disintegrate. So I'm going to have to go online and get some more of these. So I have backups. Old Navy plaid. Eh. Large. I got to get more of these shirts. So I have backups in case something happens. Like when I was in the hospital and I thought that it was gone, but it was actually just in the cupboard. I mourned. I mourned for this shirt in the hospital until I realized it was actually there. It was as if I had lost a child. Come on, T. I need a helper monkey or something. You know what? We'll start. I will go to the first paragraph break before I get up for my tea. 107.16. Chapter 5. A Strange Prison. As the group watched Jerry's helicopter, which apparently was out of control, Glenn suddenly began to laugh. The others looked at him in amazement. Jerry had me fooled too. Jerry had me fooled too for a few minutes. He's not in trouble. Jerry's doing some acrobatics for you. Pretty intricate flying maneuvers for a copter. He's really good. I'll say he is, Bert spoke up. Jerry leveled his craft and flew off. Those on the ground could visualize him grinning over his trick. Then they turned and walked back to look again at the helicopter in the hangar. Nancy climbed up to look at inside. What a battery of gadgets, she exclaimed. There must be a hundred push buttons and levers and lights on this instrument panel. As her eyes wandered over the intricate setup, Nancy noticed a penny on the floor. I wonder if Jerry dropped this, she thought. Or some passenger, perhaps crossing. Nancy picked up the penny and examined it. The coin bore the date 1923S. Hmm, that's old and valuable, she said to herself. It's like one dad has. Shall I leave it here? She decided to ask Glenn to return it to Jerry. Nancy stepped down and handed the penny to their pilot. She made her request, then added, If Jerry knows who dropped it, please call me. She wrote down the telephone number of the fraternity house. Glenn promised that he would and said they had better leave. I have another job in half an hour, he explained. The pilot took his passengers back to the airfield, then hurried off. Nancy's car was not in sight. Bess and Dave must have taken it, Nancy remarked. What do they call that? A trope? I still don't understand the definition of that, but um, is that a trope? Does that mean something that happens all the time? Because Nancy's car gets stolen. How many times? A bazillion? She needs two cars like Penny Parker. Mm. 
So good. So good. Sometimes, like, I don't measure anything in my tea. And sometimes it just doesn't hit the spot. But I got the perfect mixture of or the perfect amount of tea, the perfect amount of water, the perfect amount of milk, and the perfect amount of sugar cubes. And I'm very much enjoying it. All right. The couple had driven off in the convertible soon after their friends had left. It's not stolen. Let's do some sleuthing in this area, Dave suggested as they headed for the road. Where do we start? Bess asked. This is farming country. I'm getting one of Nancy's hunches that Zap Crossin, whoever kidnapped Ned, would pick a secluded section like this one to hide out. Right. After traveling a few miles, they came to an old, dilapidated two-story farmhouse. Bess went up on the porch of rotting floorboards. The windows had no curtains, and she could see there were only a few pieces of half-broken furniture inside the house. I guess no one lives here, she called out to Dave. He hopped from the car and came to take a look. I wonder if the house is locked. Dave tried the front door. It opened without a key. Let's explore, he urged. No, thanks, said Bess. Deserted houses with unlocked doors <laughs> Deserted houses with unlocked doors aren't my idea of safe places to investigate. Dave made no comment and walked in. If I don't return in 30 minutes, get the police, he teased, tossing Bess the car keys. Oh, I'll come, she decided. Bess was fearful, but did not want Dave to think her a coward. There was a narrow center, center hall with a steep stairway. A room opened onto it from either side. The rear of the hallway led into the kitchen, which was stocked with canned food. A knife, fork, and spoon lay in the sink alongside an unwashed plate. Someone's probably camping out here, Dave remarked. And I'll bet, Bess replied. It's someone who has no business here. But I don't want to be caught trespassing. Let's go. No, said Dave. No, said Dave. I'd like to find out who the intruder is. I'm going upstairs. You stay here on guard. Bess felt uncomfortable being left alone, but knew she would be more ill at ease on the floor above. She closed the door and posted herself near it, but presently began to walk from window to window. Suddenly, she jumped in fright as something heavy fell overhead. Bess rushed to the stairway and called up, Dave, are you all right? There was no answer. Putting her fears aside, Bess vaulted up the steps two at a time, all the while calling Dave's name. He did not reply. She hurried through the scantily furnished bedrooms, but found no sign of her friend. She could not figure out what had fallen. There was no stairway to a third floor. Oh, Dave, where are you? Bess wailed. She began opening one closet door after another, each time with a shudder as to what she might find. Finally, Bess reached the last closet. As she opened the door, she could hear muffled sounds. Nobody was inside. Bess stepped forward to put her ear to the wall. Uh-oh. I don't know how to say this. Ooh. Is she saying ooh or oh? Bess exclaimed. Ooh! Bess exclaimed as the floor suddenly opened and she plummeted downward. I don't want to exclaim too loud, unfortunately. Very thin walls here. Ooh, Bess exclaimed. The starter started startled. Start startled. The startled girl landed in the pitch darkness on something soft. It moved under her. She heard a groan. Dave, Bess murmured. Oh, I must have hurt you. You sure knocked the wind out of me. 
Good thing I'm used to tackle football. Used to tackle football. Where are we? Bess asked. At the bottom of a clothes chute, Dave answered. It was lucky there were some things in to cushion my fall. Bess asked how they were going to escape. Besides, I don't want to get caught by that person who comes here. He might be dangerous. Dave admitted he had not yet found an opening, but was sure there was one. The two captives felt every inch of the wall and floor of their prison. When they could find no doorknob nor a bolt, they began, they began to push and press the wood. I'm sure of one thing, said Dave. We're below the first floor in a cellar. There must be an opening in this wooden chute. Shoot, we're stuck. Shh, Bess whispered as he finished. Listen. She had heard the front door slam. Now there were footsteps overhead. Bess clung to Dave's arm. We'll be found, she whispered tensely. In here, I doubt it, he said, trying to reassure her with a little hug. Oh, my God. Who is there? Who is there? The two waited in silence. Floorboards creaked at the heavy, as the heavy stepping person trudged all through the house. Bess and Dave assumed he had spotted the car in front and had come to investigate. Evidently satisfied the place was vacant, the man slammed the front door again. In a few moments, Bess and Dave heard an automobile drive off. Probably a policeman, Dave suggested. At first, I thought he might be the person who's using this place. Once more, he and Bess began to push on the walls of the clothes chute. Finally, Dave put his finger in a small knot hole and was able to move a concealed door to one side. The couple stepped out into the cellar, dimly lighted by the sun streaming through a small window. The place was empty except for two musty wash tubs and a stack of dirty newspapers. How do we get out of this prison? Bess asked Dave, after glancing around. No door or other exit was visible. While she searched for a hidden exit in a wall, Dave's eyes roved back and forth across the ceiling. It was thick with dirt and cobwebs, but he thought he could detect a movable section under the kitchen. He mentioned his discovery to Bess. Climb up to my shoulders and try to open this, Dave said. People who lived here must have used a ladder. Dave leaned over. Vesp pulled herself onto his shoulders and stood up. She quickly found that a section of the ceiling could be pushed upward. With a little effort, Bess eased herself through. How are you, How are you going to get out? She asked Dave. Don't worry. The first thing I want to do is examine these clothes in the chute. There might be a clue for Nancy to work on. Bess quickly looked for a stepladder and found one in a closet. Dave reported with a laugh. All men's clothes in the chute and nothing in them but a penny in a shirt pocket. Bess giggled. Bring it up here. Might be a good luck penny. Here's a ladder. I'll hand it to you. Dave took it in and in a moment he was able... That word's not there. Dave took it, and in a moment, he was beside Bess. Then he reached down and pulled up the ladder. We better go, Bess said. Nancy and George and Bert may be back and wondering where we went. The two hurried outside without meeting anyone and drove back to the airfield. Their friends were waiting. Where have you been? George said petulantly. We thought you'd been kidnapped, too. Dave replied. We were prisoners. It's lucky we got back here. Bess, shall we tell them where we were being held? There was a twinkle in his eye. <clears throat> Bess smiled. After they tell us where they went. Nancy knew there was no use coaxing, so she briefed the couple on the helicopter trip and mentioned the 1923S penny she had found in Jerry Faber's big copter. I found a penny also, said Dave. He took the coin out of a pocket in his jeans. After looking at the date on it, he exclaimed, This is a 1923S penny, too! 
end of chapter 5. So much going on in this book. My mind's blown. It blew my mind. There's just so much going on. I'm going to forget about all this stuff that happened before. Like Marty King's going to show up again. I'm going to say, now, wait a minute. Who is Marty King? And uh, all the other people. Because we're just meeting so many new people and so much stuff is happening. You know? I think uh, it takes different amount of times for books to come from thrift books. Oops. Well, I didn't bring over all my bookmarks from my browser on the old computer. So I'm like doing it in a really stupid way. Um, but I have to bookmark thrift books. I hope that I'm still logged in. I'm logged in. Bookmark this. Okay, I want to see where my books is. Track order. Your package has just shipped. That is um, Sign of the Twisted Candles. And then my newest order. Oh, it's so pretty. I can't track it because it hasn't shipped yet. That's my Emily Dickinson book. I am so looking forward to it. Oh, I can't wait until it's nice out or like pleasant to sit outside and I could just read poetry. I keep wanting to draw things. Well, I want to do some cross stitch, but also mixed in with some watercolor paint and just, you know, I like to mix mediums, but I have these beautiful images of creations in my head like I can I can picture them but when I get my stuff in front of me I'm like oh this I can't do it I can't do it because I think I try too hard like I'm seeing beautiful blooms of flowers and I and I don't I don't want everything to look perfect, like my stitching and embroidery, um, but I want it to look magical. It's hard to make magic, you know? I don't think you can plan magic. You just have to let magic happen. Let's see what the next chapter is called. Chapter six, Mysterious Burglary. Here's another picture. <laughs> so, I don't know, I just wanna keep reading. I just wanna keep reading. I'm gonna try to get through today without a coffee. Got to make sure I don't have too much sugar. Like I don't have very many white sugar cubes left, but I got um, I got cane sugar cubes, but they don't taste as good, of course, because I'm used to white. Sh but this is like a lot of lumps. I call them cubes. These people call them lumps. This says um, 168 lumps, see? Blonde or golden cane sugar. They're quite large. They're rectangles. So they're, I guess that's why they're not cubes. I can't call them cubes because they're um, rectangle. They're like boxes. They're rectangle boxes. It's not sweet like the white sugar. Where I don't even know where this came from. I mean, I know where it came from. The grocery store. Oh, it came from Adonis, which is like 
I always thought Adonis, it's a grocery store here. Um, and I always thought it was Greek food because Adonis was a Greek god. But this store, it's uh, it's Middle Eastern. It's not Greek. Lawn Villiers is distinguished by its beautiful golden color and its subtle cane sugar flavor. I guess I don't like subtle sugar. I mean, I'm going to use a oh, product of France. Ingredients, brown cane sugar. Anyway, that is very heavy. Oh. And then I have my normal sugar. Then we have normal sugar. Normal white sugar. Right? Rogers, Atlantic, natural, cube sugar. Which are cubes. And I, I don't have too much left. Oh, I've almost finished my sock. i almost finished my socks. One time on live, I started reading The Outsiders because I had a paperback version of it, but it's gone now. I don't have it anymore. It went in the purge. I watched a movie yesterday. Oh, yeah. A movie from 1980. Teen movie called My Bodyguard. Matt Dillon. Oh, I just wanted to smack him in this movie. He was a big bully. He was a jerk in this movie. Apparently, he was 16 when he did it, when he made the movie. Um, and there were other people in it, Ruth Gordon from Rosemary's Baby and Martin Ball and other people. Um, it was good. I enjoyed it. I wouldn't watch it again. Um, it kept me watching cause I wanted to know what happened. And I don't know, there was like too much fighting in it, like fist fighting. There's a big, huge fight at the end. And it was like. This ain't a feel-good movie. Damn, I just wanted to smack Matt Dillon. He was jerk. His name was something Moody. His last name was Moody. Melvin Moody, I think it was his name. What a name. I'm glad I watched it, but it's not going into my watch again list. Uh, I have many things to watch. Rest in peace, Phil Hartman. Yes. I remember when he was murdered. That was terrible. By all accounts, he was a really nice guy. Very talented. Drugs are bad. Don't do them. I mean, sometimes we need drugs to keep us alive and stuff. But recreational drugs, don't do them. Yeah, I just feel really ugly because my hair is greasy, but I have to do something with it. It's not quite, my roots aren't quite ready to be done. And I thought I was going to do them myself, but I don't have to, like a mirror situation for doing the back. I guess I uh, will read another. Oh, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to sign off now because We've read two chapters and I want to work on my issues, <laughs> my recording issues and um, get them figured out because I will. And I haven't eaten anything yet. So I'm going to have some breakfast and work on my recording issues. Okay. I hope everyone enjoyed two more chapters of Mystery of the Glowing Eye. I am enjoying this book thoroughly. I mean, there's so much going on and so many characters and stuff. 
Um, I hope we get back to Marty King and the, uh, I don't know, like museum -y stuff. I really enjoyed more. So I don't really like the flying stuff, the aviation and whatnot. We still have to do um, the Sky Phantom, which is all about airplanes and stuff. Nancy's uh, taking flying lessons and whatnot. It's all about airplanes. We'll read it eventually. Don't you worry. All right. Thank you for joining me, those of you who joined me. And hopefully, Chapter 7 of The Invisible Truder will be uploaded today in all its wonderful glory. Okay, bye. Have a great weekend. Bye. Listen to my heart.